Good morning, everybody. We are glad to be home. I brought my bride with me of 47 years. And 34 of those 47, we got to spend right here. Uh, we got to raise our boys here. And uh, they're not boys, they're men now. And uh, they have families of their own. Uh, we have seven grandchildren, in case you don't know. And if you'd like to know more about it, I have pictures. And uh, uh, actually, I, I'm feeling a little uh, definitely older because my oldest granddaughter came to visit Nelson University. She's a senior in high school. And uh, we're praying she comes to Nelson because that means she'll be closer to us. Uh, in fact, I was in chapel at, at Nelson just a couple of weeks ago and uh, Michael Dickinson was speaking about the call of God and he was using the story of, of Esther and how that Mordecai said to her, maybe God has brought you to the kingdom for such a time as this and was challenging those students. And, and I had a flashback. I had a flashback to when I heard a similar sermon on the same story and I was a little boy at kids camp. And God started stirring my heart. And then later on at youth camp, uh, God spoke to me very clearly about him calling me into ministry and I am grateful for the call of God and I was grateful in September of this year because part of my ministry assignment is to steward the credentialing of 1,780 ministers in the North Texas district and the reason we're at 80 is because we've got some new ministers and and three of them I had the privilege of pastoring in September Pastor Jeremy Moss, uh, we recognize his credentials. Yes, Cynthia Gonzalez, we got to recognize her credentials. And, and, and Dylan Johnson in, in the northern part of our, our Metroplex, and he used to attend here. And, and uh, was, man, I, was, I felt like a proud spiritual dad. Uh, in fact, there's going to be a, a little QR code up there, I think, coming next. Uh, if you since God calling you into ministry. Maybe there's just a little twinge of, you know, I wonder what that would be like. Or maybe there's been a growing awareness, or maybe God's really spoken to you very clearly, then I'd like for you to just hit that QR code. It, it's just a little brief opportunity for us at North Texas to get to know you. My team will contact you. They'll send you some resources. And so if, if that's you, and God has been speaking to you, then that, I didn't, there wasn't a QR code when I was growing up to respond to the call of God. There was an altar, and uh, it may be that you respond to the altar later this morning, because that's where I responded. I don't know if it still is, but the first Sunday of the month was Mission Sunday when we were uh, pastoring here, and uh, I just want to give you a little quick report. When you give to missions, you never know how God's going to use that. In 1991, there were only four known believers in the nation of Mongolia. There had never been a church of any kind throughout the history of Mongolia. Communism fell. Mongolia got their freedom. Bob and Chrissy Godwin, who were pastoring over in East Dallas, they, took, they resigned, took their three uh, elementary age children. They moved to Mongolia. Bob would pastor for a while, and then he became the uh, director of the first ever spirit-filled Bible school in Mongolia. And not only, and Bob and Chrissy became members of the Lighthouse during that season, and Joy and I both have went to Mongolia, and I had the privilege of leading a group of pastors of churches throughout this North Texas area who underwrote the financial part of that school for 17 years. And Mongolia now has second generation Christians, and part of the reason is because the investment that you made every month when you sowed into the missions ministry here at the Lighthouse. They invited Joy and I to come back and to be a part of their 30th anniversary celebration. These are three of the four directors during the 30 years. Uh, you'll see right in the middle is Ed and Joy Schlossmaker. They directed the Bible school. On the far right there is Bob and Chrissy Godwin, uh, members of the Lighthouse who led the school. And then on the far uh, left there is Amga and Iggy. 
Uh, Amgai got his master's at Nelson University, and he and Iggy were part of the Lighthouse for three years. In fact, one of their girls uh, was born here. She is a United States citizen and a Texan. Uh, and Joy and I had the privilege. This next slide here is where I am preaching. Iggy is translating at the 30th anniversary. There is a church for the first time in the history of Christianity thriving in Mongolia, and you have been a very much a part of what God is doing. Joy and I are very grateful for the Lord's blessing upon the lighthouse during this transition season. We are thankful for Pastor Darius and Cindy. They both texted us this morning. They're praying for us and for you today. Uh, and uh, we know something. You've got a great pastoral team here and, and a great staff. And, and I just salute them. Joy and I, we did this morning. Uh, we prayed and will continue to pray for your pulpit committee and praying for your next spiritual leader. We know God has selected someone God's going to identify that person. He's going to make it known to you. And I'm convinced that the greatest days of the lighthouse are still ahead. I'm convinced that God is going to do mighty things here at this church. And it's partly because of your faithfulness and your commitment. We're getting ready to celebrate 85 years here in Oak Cliff. Isn't that awesome? Praise God. Take your Bibles and turn with me to the very beginning. I mean the very beginning. Genesis 1, verse 1. We're going to land in chapter number 3. But in Genesis 1, verse 1, we read these words. And if you ha have received one of these coming in, uh, you can fill in the notes as we go along today. That helps me stay focused when I'm in a service and hearing someone preach. And so I hope it will help you as well. And plus provide opportunity for you to meditate upon what God has said to you throughout the week. Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And, and it goes on to tell us that, that God created man in verse 26, and, and God created in verse 27 man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And after his creation, God said, man, this is good. Chapter 2, he gives man a wife places them in a place, paradise, perfect place, the Garden of Eden. And while they're in that garden, God gave Adam incredible freedom, but he had one restriction. And we read about that in verse 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. I mean, what an opportunity Adam had. What a weighty responsibility that rested upon his shoulders. As the first man, his decision would determine the destiny of billions. He probably didn't understand that, but it would. He had two choices. He could obey God, and the world would remain perfect, and every human would live in harmony and peace. He could disobey God, and Adam would plunge humanity into chaos and sin. I wish we were all there saying, Adam, you got to get this right. We're depending on you. Well, Genesis 3 tells us they didn't get it right. If you'll stand with me, please, for the reading of God's Word. And I'm going to read Genesis 3, verses 1 through 15. And I want to speak to you this morning on a, my title is Victory. Everybody say victory, victory within the curse. Victory within the curse. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, oh, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took up its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened. 
and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord called out to Adam, said to him, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he, God said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you that you should not eat? Now understand, God doesn't ask questions he doesn't already know the answer to. <laughs> then the man said, the woman whom you gave me, first game, the blame game, the woman who, we all have perfected that game, haven't we? You got, we had two boys, they, they knew this game. The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And then the woman said, I figured this game out. The serpent deceived me, and I ate. And so the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And God goes on to talk about the pain that woman will have in childbearing, and then to Adam that he's going to lose the garden, and that he's gonna the ground is going to be cursed because of his sake. And because of all of this, we've got hurricanes and tornadoes and floods, and, and our world has a great deal of challenges today. Father... I pray today that in spite of all the challenges that our world faces, we will discover that there's a champion who has won the victory over every one of those challenges. And I pray that every one of us will walk out of here today with a new levels of faith in your plan and purpose for our life. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. 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 You may be seated. Victory within the curse. Now, this passage is obviously about the deceit that Satan brought, disguised as a serpent. He entered the garden. He had one goal, and that was to deceive and, and ultimately destroy mankind's relationship with God. And tactic number one, Satan twists God's words in order to sow doubt in your heart. That's what he did with Eve when he said, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? He took the words of God, he twisted them in order to sow doubt in Eve's heart. He does the same with us. Tactic number two. Uh, Satan seeks to persuade you to question God's motives. So he twists God's words. And then he comes to Eve, and, and when Eve said, if we eat of this tree, we're going to die, he said, oh, you will not surely die. God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes are going to be open. There was some truth in that. Their eyes were open, and you will be like God. No truth there. They already were. They were in the image of God. But you will know good from evil. Satan wants to persuade you that God's holding out on you. That God doesn't have your best interest at heart. You know, I, this phone, uh, when Steve Jobs invented it, he also came up with a, an incredible approach that Apple still uses today, even though he's already passed on. And, and that is, the next year they're going to come out with a better model. And then a better model. And then a better model. And we, we're dissatisfied with the one we got in our hands because this next one's got AI. Uh, in it, and we got to have that one. And guess what? Satan sort of uses that inside of us to, to say that, you know, there's something better than what you have, and God's holding out on you, keeping you from the better. They had the best there was. They had fellowship with God. They had a perfect environment, and Satan was a liar. Tactic number three, Satan appeals to your desires. I mean, the tree, man, it's good for food. It's pleasant to the eyes. A tree desirable. Notice, good, pleasant, desirable. And Satan never comes along and gives you the true consequences of sin. You do this, you're going to jail. You do this, you're going to die. No, he doesn't do that. He says, man, you, you do this, you're going to get a high. 
you do this, you're going to have more money than you used to have. You, you get involved in this and you're going to have more friends than you used to have because they're all doing it. He's lying to you. He's appealing to your desires. But today, I'm not going to focus on the enemy. I'm going to focus on the champion. I'm going to focus on the victory. And in fact, the New Testament tells us and gives us a wonderful promise. And it's found in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 12 and 13. And here's what it says. Therefore, let him who thinks he stand take heed lest he fall. Guess what? We're all Adam and Eve. We've all sinned. <laughs> We've all given into temptation. I, I can't go back and blame them for, for my choices. I have to be responsible for my choices. Therefore, let him take heed that thinks he stands lest he fall. No temptation. Everybody say no temptation. No temptation has overtaken you except the kind of temptation that all the rest of us face. Now, that's my paraphrase. But God is faithful. Say that with me. God is faithful. Turn to your neighbor and say, God's faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation will also make, here it is, everybody say the way of escape. The way of escape that you may be able to bear it. It doesn't say a way of escape. It says the way of escape. Now, I'll help you understand that in here in a moment. God uh, wants every one of us to know that even though we're going to all face temptation, there's the way of escape. You know, when Jesus came to planet Earth, he obviously came, and we sang about it. We worship him this morning because he is our Savior, and he came to redeem us from the curse through his blood. He came to die on the cross so that we might have life, that we might be forgiven of our sin. And if you've walked into the doors today, and you've got sin in your heart, and your relationship is broken with God, you can walk out of here forgiven. You can walk out of here free. You can walk out of here with that burden lifted. You can walk out here with that guilt gone because of the grace of God. That's why he came. But he also came to earth to show us how to live life. And he, he gave us an example of how to find the way of escape when he goes into the wilderness of temptation. In fact, it says Jesus was tempted in all points just like we are, yet without sin. And, and the first thing I, I learned from Jesus when he goes into the wilderness, it starts in Luke chapter 3 where Jesus is baptized in the Jordan and it says that the heavens opened and the Spirit of God descended in the form of a dove and rested upon Jesus and Luke 4 verse 1 says to us that Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit and then it was the Spirit that led him into the wilderness and while he was there he was tempted by the enemy during that 40 day period of prayer and fasting and then in, in verse number 14 Luke tells us that Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit here's the deal if you are walking with the Holy Spirit, if you're walking in the way of the Holy Spirit, he will lead you to the way of escape. Paul says it this way, walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Joy was preaching at University Church in Waxahachie last month. And uh, she was talking about when she got baptized in the Holy Spirit as a, a, a young girl and began to speak in other tongues, but her t parents and others wisely taught her that that's not just a one-time experience at an altar, that's to be an ongoing walk and relationship with the Holy Spirit and that you can pray in tongues on a daily basis because he who prays in tongues edifies, builds up himself from a spiritual standpoint. And she told how that she would get ready to go to school and her mother who is Sally Snodgrass. Some of you remember Sally. Uh, she worked here for eight years. She was our receptionist. She was a, all, just one. I got the best mother-in-law in the world. And she had her birthday this week. Her birthday is on October 31st. All over the world they celebrate. Give candy out. Just honor a mamma. She turned 93. 93. I am thankful for my mother-in-law because she told my wife that's what my wife then, I hadn't even met her yet, uh, told Joy, said, have you prayed in tongues before you left for school? No, I haven't. Well, go into your room, pray in tongues, then you go to school. You know what? My wife prays in tongues every morning. That's the first thing she does when she gets up, she starts praying in tongues. Her mother taught her a very important principle, taught her the way of escape, the way of the Spirit. And, 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 and when you're in fellowship with I mean, excuse me, when you are walking with the Holy Spirit, he will lead you to the way of escape. Second thing, when Jesus was going out into that wilderness, he wasn't just going out there in order to battle the enemy. He was actually going out there to spend time with his father. 
40 days of prayer and fasting. It was time with the Father. When you study the life of Jesus, you'll see that every time he prays, every time except for one, there's one time when he's on the cross and everything is going dark and he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But every other time he says, Father. Even on the cross, at the very end, he says, Father, into you I commit my spirit. He was spending time with the Father. If you're in fellowship with the Father, he will show you the way of escape. Because that verse of scripture says that God is faithful. We serve a faithful God, but we serve a God who is our Father. And, and when we learn, as Jesus did, to surrender our will to the Father's will, we are in the pathway to discovering the way of escape. Remember that prayer Jesus gave his disciples? Teach us to pray, they said. Here's what he said. Our what? Father, who is in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You want to know the way of escape? That is surrender your will to the Father's will, and you're in the right place to find the way of escape. And later on, in that same prayer, he said, pray this way. He says, Father, do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, from the same one that Jesus faced out in the wilderness. Third thing that Jesus teaches us is this. And you know this. All three of those temptations in Luke chapter number four, Jesus responds with what? It is written. When Satan comes, one of his the desires of Jesus. He'd been fasting for 40 days. He was hungry. And, and he says, you're the son of God. Command the stones to become bread. Jesus answered him saying, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And then when the devil showed it, took him up on the mountain, says, if you'll bow down and worship me, I will bring the whole world to you. And, and, and Jesus had come to have the whole world come to him and it was going to require him to go across and, and he, he's not going to take the easy way out he's certainly not going to take Satan's way out and he says to Satan get behind me Satan for it is written you shall worship the Lord God only he is the only one that you should worship here's the deal if you have saturated your mind and heart with God's word you will recognize the way of escape See, some people think that verse, he's going to provide a way of escape. I can live how I want to. I can do my life, do my will, go where I want to go. And one day I'm in trouble, boom, God's going to open the door. No, no, no. <laughs> That's not the way it works. you got to saturate your mind and your heart with God's word. Romans 12, what did Paul say? Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. See, the way of escape is a pathway. The way of escape is a lifestyle. It's not a religious exercise. I like what John Mark Comer said in his book, and I'm going to recommend a book to you if you haven't read this, called Practicing the Way. And, and, and actually, it was this morning, I'm, I'm getting the last part of the message, I thought, man, I should have checked that book out. So I grabbed it real quick. He said, most people have a plan for their money. Call it a budget. It's a good thing. If you don't have one, I suggest you get one. Most people have a plan for their time. It's a schedule, a calendar. They have all sorts of plans for their education, their career, their retirement, their family, their kids' soccer team, their gym routine, and on and on and on. But very few have a plan to be with Jesus and to thoughtfully apprentice under him in such a way that over time, they become the people who naturally do and say the kinds of things Jesus said and did. You see, I'm talking to you about the way of escape, a life, walking with the Spirit, lived in fellowship with the Father, and saturated with the Word of the living God. When you're in that way, See, unfortunately, there are many Christians that live too close to the way of deceit and the way of temptation. And some of you know what I'm talking about. You know that when you're sitting here 
opening this up to the wrong place, you're in the wrong way. And it's going to lead you down a wrong path. You know that if you're hanging out with this group of friends, that that group of friends has a tendency to get you off course. And because of you're spending too much time with them, you get off course. But when you're spending more time with him, he keeps you on course. It's about the way, the way you live, the lifestyle you have, the direction that you are heading. You see, your life is a byproduct of your lifestyle. And when your lifestyle is walking with the Spirit, spending time with the Father and the Son, and meditating upon God's Word. In fact, how did David say, Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. And that brings me to verse 15, the curse. Satan's, the serpent's curse. God said to him, the serpent, because you've done this, you're cursed more than all the cattle. There's, there's a curse that woman has to live out, man has to live out. But right in the middle of this curse, there is what is identified by theologian as the protevangelium. I don't even know if I said that right. All right? But, but that's the word, protevangelium. Now, this one I know. It means it's the first gospel. In other words, it's the first hint in Scripture about what God was preparing to do for man. It, it, it's the first prophecy in Scripture that's pointing to Messiah. It, it's the first promise in Scripture that we know brought about the revelation of Jesus. Because you have done this, you are cursed. Satan's entrance into the Garden of Eden was a declaration of war against God, against humanity, and it has eternal consequences. Satan is real. The devil is real. Evil is real in our world. He is described in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, chapter 20, verse 2, as the serpent of old who leads the world astray. Here's what Jesus said about Satan. He said he is a murderer from the beginning. There is no truth in him. He is a liar and the father of lies. That's chapter 8. Chapter 10, Jesus says his mission is to steal, kill, and destroy. Paul said it this way. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. It's not that person sitting beside you or in your family or that you work with that's your enemy. No, we wrestle against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, in addition to the things I've already talked to you about, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. There's a real enemy. It's a real curse. We're all living under the curse. But there's a promise right in the middle of this curse. Just like an acorn holds the potential of a towering oak inside of it, this curse has the seed of victory inside of it. <clears throat> because in this verse, Genesis 3.15, we have the precursor to John 3.16. Genesis 3.15 says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. Her seed. She hasn't had a child yet, but she's going to have a child. And her seed ultimately will be born the Messiah. There will come a supernatural birth to a virgin by the name of Mary. Angel Gabriel said to Mary, do not be afraid, Mary. You found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, a seed, and shall call his name Jesus. When he comes to Joseph, her husband, who's going to divorce her, he says to Joseph, we're getting ready to celebrate that next month at Christmas. The virgin will be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Yes, there's a curse upon Satan and upon the ground and upon the earth and upon the woman and upon the man. But in the middle of the curse, there's victory. In the middle of this curse, there is for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Second thing is, is spiritual warfare. We've talked about this a little bit already this morning. But God says, I'm going to put enmity 
between you and the woman, between your seed and and her seed. We, we are in a cosmic conflict, and uh, Paul referenced it. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Jesus, we heard it. He called Satan the father of lies. <clears throat> in fact, he said to a group of religious leaders, well, you are of your father the devil. I don't want to be. I don't, want my, I don't want the devil to be my father. I want my father to be the one who created the heavens and the earth. Our father who is in heaven. In this verse is the cross. You shall bruise his heel. Serpent, you're going to bruise the heel of the seed of woman. And it's referring to the suffering of Jesus. From Bethlehem, where Satan tried to destroy Jesus as an infant, all the way to Calvary, Satan and his followers have attempted to destroy Jesus, but all they could do was bruise his heel. Judas, Herod, Pilate, the Romans, all conspired to crucify him. But they did not destroy him. They thought they did when they killed him on the cross. They thought they had won when they placed him into that tomb because his body was dead, laid in that tomb. But the scripture says his body, unlike ours, did not see decay because the same spirit that empowered him in the wilderness, scripture says that spirit that planted the seed of life in the womb of Mary, that same spirit came into that tomb on Sunday morning on that third day and that body that was dead was brought back to life and because he lives, we shall live also and the beginning seed of that truth is right here in Genesis chapter 3. In fact, Satan's destiny is here too. You're going to bruise his heel, but he is going to bruise your head. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. He conquered temptation. He cast demons out of people who were possessed. He defeated death at the resurrection. He triumphed over the powers of darkness, Scripture says, at the cross. His resurrection is sort of like when the soldiers from the Allied forces stormed Normandy on what's now known as D-Day. That day was the turning point for World War II. That day is the day that we looked back to and realized that's when Hitler finally had lost. Now, there were other battles to fight. There were other skirmishes. There were others that were going to die in, in the fighting. But it is that day when Jesus was resurrected from the grave. On that day, the devil was defeated. There are other battles to fight. We haven't got to the final victory yet. But there is coming a day in which, as Revelation 20 says, I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan and bound him for a thousand years at the end of the thousand years Satan is released now I never understood why God was gonna do that but I'll just leave that up to him and he goes out to deceive the nations but here's what it says in chapter 20 verse 10 the devil who deceived them who deceived Eve who deceived the nations who's deceived every one of us in the room at some point in time he is cast into the lake of fire he's tormented day and night and ladies and gentlemen in the seed of Genesis 3 verse 15 is the conqueror the champion there is victory in the curse because the victor is Jesus You know what the Bible says? He who knew no sin became sin. Jesus, who never sinned, never had a wrong thought, never did a wrong deed, he became sin. He took every wrong thought you've had, every wrong thought I've had, every wrong thing we've done, every inappropriate word we've ever spoken, every one of them was placed on him. Jews couldn't figure this out for so long because the Bible says cursed is anyone who dies on a tree and he died on a cross. Why? He took our curse. 
God spoke a curse on serpent, a curse on Adam, and a curse on Eve. We're all under a curse because we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. But Jesus, the seed of woman, the seed of promise, our victor, our champion, he became cursed so that the curse could be removed from your life. He became sin so that the sin that separates you from God can be washed away out of your life and your existence so that you can stand before God as righteous. We've all given in to temptation. We're all under the curse of sin and death. But there's victory in the curse. When you walked in the doors of this church this morning, you're either walking in under a curse or you're walking in under grace. How did you come? Did you come with the curse of sin? And we've all walked in that curse. So I'm not here to condemn you. In fact, even John 3.16 goes into the next verse. Says, he didn't come to condemn the world. Jesus didn't come to condemn you. Now, he's honest with you when he shows you con your condition. But he came to save you. He came to forgive you. He came to set you free. He came to give you a hope of everlasting life. You see, the curse leads to death, but grace leads to life. How do you want to leave here today? You want to leave here forgiven? You want to leave here walking under the grace of God? In fact, the scripture tells us that, that God promised grace to us even before time began, even before Genesis 1 verse 1, God said, I've got grace for the people of the lighthouse. And I'm going to make sure that they get it because my son, the lamb, was slain before the foundation of the world. How do you leave here today? Are you going to leave here forgiven? Are you going to leave here where your, your sins washed clean? You're going to leave here walking in the grace and the mercy and the love of God? Are you going to leave here serving your father, the devil? Or are you going to leave here serving your father in heaven? I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes for a moment. <clears throat> the way of escape. The ultimate way of escape comes through the cross. The ultimate way of escape, escape from sin, escape from death, escape from living a life headed the wrong direction, is where God offers you a way of grace, a way of mercy, a way of forgiveness, a way of hope, all born out of the fact that he loves you with an everlasting love. The curse is lifted because God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son. That if you will just respond in faith to him, then forgiveness comes into your heart and into your soul. If you're here today and say, Pastor Greg, I walked through those doors this morning with sin in my heart, separating me from God, but I want to walk out with Jesus in my heart. I want to walk out of here forgiven today. I want to walk out of here knowing that God is my Father. I want to walk out of here today knowing that God has prepared an eternal home in heaven for me. And I want to walk out of here knowing that day that God wants to give me all that I need to live life in this world for Him. If you need forgiveness today, if you need grace today, if you need to respond to God's offer of salvation today if you want to walk out of here different than the way you walked in then I want to ask you to just raise your hand let me see it thank you thank you thank you thank you anyone else you want to walk out of here different than the way you walked in today God's speaking to you it's your opportunity thank you I see that hand under the arches thank you anyone else today You can walk out different by just responding in faith to him. Thank you. I see that hand. 
Praise God. Wait just another moment. Hallelujah. Talking about walking out of here. I want to ask all of you that raised your hand to, to take a walk. Jesus came all the way from heaven to earth to show his love to you. I'm just going to invite you to come and stand right here with me at this altar. And we're going to pray together. So that when you walk out of here, we will have prayed in faith, knowing that you're leaving here different than how you came. So for those of you that lifted your hand, would you just come and stand right here this morning? We're going to pray together. God's going to do a wonderful work in your heart. Pastor Jeremy's going to lead us. The prayer of invitation. Several of you lifted. Go ahead. Don't wait on somebody else. You just go ahead and begin to come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. 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 Jesus. Hallelujah. In name that is above all other The man who came Praise and died Jesus. my soul Hallelujah. to save. Hallelujah. Praise God. You know, part of the reason I wanted to come down here and stand right beside you is to say to you, we all stand with you in this moment. Because those of us that know Jesus, there came a point in our life where we responded to his gift. We responded to his invitation. And, and, and we're not here to continue. We're here to celebrate with you. We're here to join our faith with you in this decision that you're making today, this new way, this new path that you're going to walk on. In fact, I want to, I want to lead you in a prayer. And, and people all over this auditorium are going to pray this prayer with us. First of all, it's a reminder that we stand right beside you. And we all needed Jesus. We all needed his forgiveness. Just like Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River that day, <laughs> that was a baptism for forgiveness of sins he had no sin to be forgiven of but he was standing beside me standing beside you secondly we're going to pray this prayer because it reminds us and it gives us a fresh opportunity to say thank you God for what you did in my life so we're standing with you and we're also thanking God for, for what he has done but it's a, just a wonderful expression of our faith but it needs to come out of your heart and if you want to pray words that God's put in your heart then you just go right ahead and do that because he's going to hear your words and he's going to respond to your faith. And we're going to pray this prayer together. Dear Jesus, I believe that you are God's son. You came into this world to show us God's love. You lived a perfect life, a sinless life. And I confess to you that I have sin in my life. I have sin in my heart. But I also believe that when you died on the cross, you died for my sin. And I open my heart now. And I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I open my heart to receive your love and your grace. From this day forward, I'm going to read your word so I'll know your will for my life. I'm going to worship with your family so I can grow in my faith. And I'm going to tell others what you've done today. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless you. Now, before you leave, I want you to follow Romolo right here. He's got some things they want to hand you before you walk out. They want to help you get started on this way of faith, on this journey with Christ. Church, let's give God another expression of gratitude for the work that he's done today. Hallelujah. Never take for granted what just took place. I can look around this room and there's some people in this room right here where I saw come to the altar for the first time, gave their heart to Jesus, and they're here worshiping the Lord today. And I, I, I've met people in almost every church I go to that somewhere their life intersected with the ministry of the Lighthouse, with Brother and Sister Hibbert, 
or we're Dallas Metro, or we're Team Challenge, you know, somehow, some play, this church has sowed seeds of faith that is bearing fruit out there. But before I, I, I transition the service back, I want to ask this question. When I was preaching today, I was preaching as much to the followers of Jesus as I was those who need Jesus about the way of escape. If you're here today and you say, Pastor Greg, to be honest, when you were talking about how often I put myself in the wrong spot, I identified with that. When you were talking about this not just being, oh, all of a sudden God's going to open a door, I need to live a lifestyle that is following a path that helps me to have spiritual strength so that when the enemy comes, I'm ready for it. I'm not in panic mode. I'm not in hoping that I might be able to overcome. I am living as an overcomer. And today, I want to once again express my heart before God that I want to walk in the Spirit. I want to honor my Father. I want to spend time in His Word because I want to follow the way of escape as my lifestyle and not just as a bailout. If that's you, I want you to just stand right now and just lift your hands toward heaven. You're saying, that's me. I, 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 I want to live in that way of escape. I want to, I want to live in the Spirit. I want to follow the Lord. I want, I, want to, I want to live in victory. I don't want to be defeated. I've had too many defeats in my life. I've given in too often. You know, the good news is if we fail, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins if we confess them and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. That was written to believers. So again, this is not about condemnation. This is about motivation. This is about recognition that I'm as vulnerable as Eve I'm as vulnerable as Adam. I, actually, I don't know if you've ever noticed this part. I didn't, I didn't talk about it because our time was getting away. She's never called Eve before the curse, the woman that God gave to Adam. But after God says that out of her seed, and then talks about her bearing children, in chapter 3, verse 20, Adam in faith says that I'm going to call her Eve, the mother of all living. And every person that's alive in this room, we all go back to Eve. Thank you, Eve, for bearing that first child, Abel. And that second one, that rascal, Cain, the, the, the murderer. And then Seth, the substitute. But more importantly, thank you, Adam, for by faith believing that she was going to be the one through whom the seed was going to come to keep us out of darkness. <laughs> Some of you just caught that. <laughs> and give us the light. Lift your hands to the Lord if you're standing. Father, today, I stand here today with sons and daughters of yours and we're still in a battle we, the enemy has not walked out and said oh Jesus is coming back I'm giving up no in fact he knows his time is short and so he's launched continual attacks upon the earth upon men upon women upon nations and upon those in this room but Lord today we're believing your word that our God is faithful that there is no temptation no temptation that has taken a command, but you're faithful. And Lord God, we are believing that with the temptation, we're going to be already on the path in the way of escape because we're going to live for you. We're going to walk with you. We're going to lead our lives to your spirit. And God, as a result of, of following after you and your spirit, we are going to live overcoming lives for the glory of God. And I just bless sons and daughters right now with new levels of faith to believe that they're going to walk out of here in the way of escape, in the way of victory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's give God praise.